to another great show with Sean on boxing. So today we're talking about crazy fans in and around boxing. This has long been a problem with boxing fans. A lot of radicalized fans, fanboying for certain fighters. I know some people say I'm a Lomachenko fan and a Manny Pacquiao fan, but you don't see me being a radical fan. You don't see me being a hate-filled hater towards everybody else and going to every end of the earth to try to justify what my fighter is doing. I mean, you look at knockout boxing and his content before with regards to Spence and now with Tank Davis, that is epitome of fanatical. When every two videos you release out of three it is a fanboy video, right? And all you can do is hate on every other fighter to fanboy for your fighter, right? Like I know Lomachenko, uh, Doc Tank Davis. My point was, I wonder why people had this high energy for Loma, who chose to step away and reconvene later on next year, kind of like what Bud Crawford did in the Spence fight. And that worked out well for him. Maybe Loma's trying to do the same type of thing. But then they ignore the seven years of ducking and they deny, blatantly deny the Tank Davis duck Lomachenko. But then they're in their feelings over what's going on with Loma now. Even though in truth, the fight that Tank Davis should have always been chasing was the Shakur Stevens fight. Those are the two guys that need each other. They need to build their legacy. Lomachenko doesn't need them. And this is similar to Canelo Alvarez. I'm not a fan of Canelo Alvarez. When he ducked Golovkin, I called him out on ducking. He's ducking Benavides. I called him out on it. But the reality is him fighting Mangui and Berlanga aren't bad fights, right? If this was anybody else except for Canelo Alvarez, people would have no problem with it at all. Example, look at who Tank Davis has fought in his last fucking five, six fights, right? Nobody is better than Berlanga or Manguia. But people are okay with that. Once again, showing the hypocrisy. But today we're going to be looking at these radicalized fans. So stay tuned to then and we will see you in a minute. Welcome back, boxing fans. We see this even from the media. When we look at Paul Malinaggi and Pro Box and how they're so emotional with regards to Canelo Alvarez, but then they, they ignore what goes on with Tank Davis. And I'm not trying to hate on Tank Davis, but people like to compare these two fighters, which is ridiculous because one fighter is already a legend. The other fighter has not even had a legacy fight in his career. The two best opponents on his resume are Leo Santa Cruz, who was at the end of his career in his fourth weight division, and Petraza, who after that fight moved up two more weight classes, showing you that he was struggling at that weight. That was not his best weight at that time. Obviously, he moved up to 135, became a champion right after that, and then moved up to 140. Obviously, couldn't become champion at that weight class, and thus has moved back down in weight to 135, where Keyshawn Davis just recently beat him. Um, but those are the two best names on his resume. Whereas Canelo Alvarez, people will literally, like Andre Ward, go out of their way to talk about how everybody he's fought has been picked specifically because they were too old, too active, inactive, coming off of a loss. It sounds literally like he's describing what Floyd Mayweather did and what Floyd Mayweather then had Tank Davis do, right? And I don't just hate on Floyd Mayweather in this scenario. I went back historically and said that Bob Arum at top rank maneuvered their fighters this way. Floyd Mayweather, De La Hoya, Pacquiao, Cotto, right? Loma, Shakur, Bud Crawford, right? They always had a way that they moved their fighters and they always tried to build their fighters up, giving them titles and opportunities to showcase them and build them up so that they could get as much money out of them as possible. Smart business by top rank. So if you're gonna be critical of some fighters, because of the color of their skin, then you got to like keep that same energy because they've all been maneuvered in the same way, right? We know why war does it, jealousy. We know why Polly does it, jealousy, right? These are two fighters who never could become big names in their careers, right? When Polly was a welterweight champion, he was seen as the lowest fruit on the tree. That's why, of course, Adrian Broner jumped up two weight divisions to take him on because he was the lowest hanging fruit 
right? Uh, it wasn't because he was chasing after the biggest and baddest fighters at 147, because obviously he wasn't doing that. But let's get to this. So today, obviously, we're talking about radicalized fans in boxing. Uh, and this is the perfect picture for it. So let's move forward. So this really started off from this comment from one of my subs, Damon Wester. And Damon's a good guy, right? He's on my channel. And for the most part, he's a respectful subscriber. But obviously, he has very pro-Black American sort of perspective, right? And this obviously comes off of him consistently, right? This is an example of it. So let's just make this bigger so I can read it and you can see it clearly. So there we go. So the guy on pay-per-view who sells millions upon millions more than the suspect Hall of Famer, which is a joke, who did he beat to become a definitive lock into the Hall of Fame? Let's be honest. So right now what he's trying to do is defend Shakur, Steve, uh, sorry, Tank Davis and, and shit on Vasily Lomachenko. Lomachenko is a three-weight world champion. He did it faster than anyone else in boxing. Tanaka obviously equaled that. Um, he was a three-belt unified champion and really, you know, could have fought uh, Richard Comey to become undisputed, right? Everything he's done from day one has been radically criticized and hated on from certain uh, people within YouTube, right, who, who never really wanted to see this guy really achieve or do anything great so they consistently always shit on him picked against him and even when time and time again he proved them wrong then they didn't give him credit for his victories right him coming off of a controversial loss to Devin Haney oh he was supposed to fight Shakur Stevenson right afterwards so him coming off of a undisputed unification fight which was controversial which had him thinking about retirement afterwards he needed to fight Shakur yet Shakur like Tank Davis, is in a position where neither of these fighters have done fucking anything in the sport of boxing. Neither of them have had a legacy fight, right? You can be critical of Lomachenko and say, well, he lost three of his big fights, right? Obviously, uh, trying to become a champion in the second fight, losing to Salido. If you saw that fight, you could be honest. Let's not be dishonest. The Lopez fight, which obviously I did feel he lost, especially because he lost the 12th round, but it was still a very competitive fight. And even in the second half of that fight, it looked like Lomachenko was close to potentially stopping uh, Lopez. And then Devin Haney, the majority of people that watched that fight felt that he won that fight. So I know people don't want to give credit to people who lost fights, but they don't want to give credit to people who won fights, right? When Canelo wins fights, then they try to downplay and dismiss them because he didn't win conclusively, <laughs> right? You know. Guys like this are going to find ways to consistently hate on some people to fanboy for others. So you're going to use Tank Davis's pay-per-view success as a way to discredit Lomachenko. You being a pound-for-pound -pound fighter obviously doesn't mean anything because look at the way this same person, Damon Wester and others, shit on Canelo Alvarez, who is a bigger pay-per-view star than Tank Davis. Right. So you can see the inconsistencies coming from these radicalized fans. Right. And saying that Lomachenko is honestly, let's stop letting effort get us in the Hall of Fame. I mean, the reality is Lomachenko did more than Andre Ward. Yet a guy like this will justify and talk about why Andre Ward deserves to be a Hall of Famer. But yet what did Andre Ward do more than Lomachenko? nothing he doesn't have a better resume he hasn't achieved more in the sport of boxing not in the pros or the amateurs that's just the reality but let's move forward um unboxing is discrediting tank who's made more money in one fight than loma's whole career and sells more is more known as the young enough to have the bigger significance career uh at 30 than loma did so you hear what he just said here he ignored resume he ignored accomplishments. He ignored everything significantly, which people 20, 25, 35 years from now are going to use to look at Tank Davis's career and evaluate how much he really did in the sport. Becoming a three-weight regular WBA champion is insignificant. He's won one legitimate title at 130 and was just now elevated at 135 
and, and hasn't done anything at 140 except literally put rehydration clauses on the two fighters that he faced at that weight class. Right. And not that I said he needed to move to that division because I never said he had to. But if you're going to fight fighters from that division, then you should prove that you are the kind of guy that doesn't need to do that because that's the same status you hold Canelo to. So let's hold him to the same. Sean leaves out the part of him ducking Shakur to fight a bum in Cambosis. Well, Cambosis is obviously not a f bum. Cambosis is a more credible fighter at 135 than Shakur Stevenson is. His biggest win is better than any win Shakur's had at 135. He was a three belt unified, should have been an undisputed champion at 135. Uh, Shakur Stevenson, his biggest win at, at, at 135 is nobody. He doesn't have a significant win at 135. Three opponents, none of whom uh, are really uh, high level, arguably bottom level top 10, if top 10, right? None of whom have done anything or done anything significantly. But he's going to try to use that narrative that Lomachenko coming off of a loss, duck Shakur. Yet never in history have you literally seen somebody coming off of a loss be pushed to fight a pound for pound fighter coming off of a loss. The reality is Devin Haney's the one that ducked Shakur because Devin Haney was the one that was mandated by the WBC to fight his mandatory opponent, Shakur Stevenson, and chose to drop that title, drop it, to move up to 140, right? It's ironic that when Lomachenko chose to fight Lopez for unification, he was criticized because he didn't fight Devin Haney. Yet Devin Haney moves up in weight, drops his title, ducking Shakur, and he gets a pass. This is consistently what we see from these kind of radicalized fans who don't want to give you truth. They'd rather give you fucking narrative over that. But okay, so here we go. But two top in another bum often says he should fight Shakur instead of the great white hype is by far the lamest shit I've ever heard on Sean's channel. So Tank Davis fighting Shakur is lame. Even though if you ask guys like this, they would list and rank both Tank Davis and Shakur above Lomachenko, right? The same guys that are so emotional about Lomachenko walking away from this fight and don't question why he walked away, even though negotiations were going on for months and we'd heard that he was close to being signed. Loma literally flew over there and at that point walked away. You have to ask yourself, what precipitated this kind of action from him. But regardless, it doesn't matter. He still walked away, kind of like Chris Eubank did for Golovkin, right? And many other fighters have. But okay, so he walked away. But the reality is, didn't you have Shakur and Tank Davis ranked number one and two at 135 pounds? So why are you wanting Tank Davis to fight the number three fighter and skip over and duck the number two fighter, right? That's what doesn't make sense to me. These guys are more afraid of Shakur. That's why they're pushing Tank to fight the 37-year-old fighter who just came off of a loss to Devin Haney, as opposed to Shakur Stevenson, who they feel maybe is too good for Tank Davis. I, I don't know. You you know, only they can answer that question. But you know, uh, if there's smoke, there's fire, right? Me, I have faith in Tank Davis. That's why in it, it, Initially, I was pushing for the Shakur Tank Davis fight. Knockout Boxing was pushing for the Lomachenko fight and ridiculed me because he said, oh, you're protecting your fighter. I'm protecting my fighter. But yet you rank Shakur and Tank Davis above my fighter. But yet you want your fighter to fight the guy ranked below. So who was really ducking and who's really putting up roadblocks? Not me. I just knew the business of boxing. I knew that Lomachenko probably would unify with Navarrete right? Allowing Shakur and Tank Davis to fight. And obviously the Navarrete Lomachenko fight was an in-house ESPN fight. But unfortunately in that situation, Lomachenko's uh, fighter for unification ended up losing to his countrymen. And obviously that threw uh, a wrench into the situation. And then as far as negotiation, I have no idea what happened in negotiation so there's no point in me speculating and pointing fingers and accusing anybody Lomachenko walked away we blame Lomachenko now let's see if Tank Davis the guy who literally needs Lomachenko because Loma doesn't need him Loma's legacy is already fucking secured right 
him fighting Tank Davis at this point of his career, if he beats Tank Davis, that's fucking a great win. But if he loses, it's not going to ruin his legacy because people right now all have Tank Davis ranked higher than Lomachenko on every fucking list, whether it's pound for pound or the lightweight rankings. Uh, but here we go. And I've heard some crazy shit coming out of this guy's mouth. The reality is he hasn't heard crazy shit coming from my mouth, but I've heard crazy shit come from his mouth, right? And he's been fucking uh, called out on it countless times for his fanboyism. And that's what it is. And you notice how backlash of ducking, like he did Arrow of Bud, when a white guy is involved, all the standards for black fighters go out the window. Go watch Pro Box on Loma leaving the tank negotiations if you don't believe me. I don't know what that means. But but the reality is Pro Box, like myself, understood that Lomachenko's legacy is already assured. And Tank Davis needs him. And the fact that he's challenging him now when he's 37, as opposed to before when they could have unified at 130, that's what Pro Box brought up. That's what everyone brought up. Because literally Floyd Mayweather came out and said, we're going to age out Lomachenko. And now this was exactly that. They said what they were going to do, and now they're doing it. So if people are critical of that, it's for a reason. It's because it's blatant. And it's fucking out there, and they told you about it. But, of course, a guy like him would choose to ignore that and would give Tank Davis a pass for those fucking last seven years. Um, you know, the irony is this has nothing to do with black or white. He's bringing Errol Spence into this. Errol Spence blatantly ducked Bud Crawford fight for five years. We saw the fucking video. We saw him face-to-face -face with Errol Spence and Bud Crawford, with Bob Arum there, with him going, uh, I've met Al Heyman. And Bob is like, yes, yes, we all have met him, right? You know, Bob is just like talking to a child because Errol is like so fucking, you know, he's not his own boss. And it's clear. Al Heyman listed who he was going to fight. He told you. And then Bud Crawford said, oh, but, but not me. Five years we were waiting for that fight, and he chose to fight lightweights and other fighters. You're going to criticize Lomachenko because just now, after a three or four months since the Cambosis fight, Lomachenko is ducking. So Lomachenko gets tons of criticism because we've expected a Tank Davis-Lomachenko fight within the last six months, not even six months. But we're going to compare that to the criticism Errol Spence came under after five years of blatantly ducking Bud Crawford. And for the PBC, obviously ducking Bud Crawford far longer than that, back to 140, and we just saw recently at 154. Thank you, Turkey al for basically kiboshing the PBC and Al Heyman's plans to once again fucking kind of ruin Bud Crawford's career, which we saw that they were trying to do when they pushed Errol Spence into the ring post fucking Funduro Tim Zoo fight, right? So... We know what the PBC has done consistently a a and trying to compare that situation to Lomachenko is ridiculous because the only reason this fight didn't happen was because of Tank Davis up until this particular time. And it's the fact that Lomachenko chooses to say, OK, let those two fucking guys fight and I'll fight the winner. Why should I do all the heavy lifting? He's got a point. He's done all the heavy lifting. Those guys have done fucking nothing. Neither one of them. And Shakur moans, groans, complains, and bitches like crazy. Now you got the fucking opportunity. Jump at it. If you don't, you're going to be criticized because you were just all over social media whining and fucking moaning. And for Tank Davis, literally, you talk about being the face of boxing and people criticize Canelo for fighting Manguia and Berlanga. But who are you going to fucking fight? Nobody better. You're probably going to fight Isaac Cruz again in a rematch. As if that's fucking more significant than a Munguia or a Berlanga. It's not. Right? It's not more significant. But okay. Because these guys are radical fanboys who, who don't hold the same fucking kind of standards for everybody. Right? And that's just the truth when it comes to boxing. Right? We have radical fans that are ridiculous. So here's Tank Davis. And I ain't shitting on Tank Davis. I'm just keeping it real. I'm not the one comparing Tank Davis to fucking Canelo Alvarez and saying that Tank Davis is the face of boxing. That's you. You say that. I don't say that. I say he's a top five pound for pound fighter now on my list. That's pretty fucking 
big, right? I literally list him above Canelo Alvarez now on my pound for pound list, um, right? But I'm a hater and I don't like him because he's black. Well, he's not really that black. He's marginally darker than me, but okay. Like this is the narrative some people would like you to believe because with them, everything is race. With me, this has nothing to do with race. I've praised Tank Davis, put him high on my pound for pound list, talked about him being one of the five most exciting fighters in the sport of boxing and one of the future kings of pay-per-view in boxing. But when you look at his resume right here in front of you, it's fucking lacking quality of a guy that's supposed to be a pound for pound great fighter and uh, the face of the sport. Petraza, he faced in 2017. And then bum, 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 bum old man fucking old man uh a good fighter but untested uh somebody nobody knew a fucking bum a guy that he pulled up in weight uh fucking ryan garcia who nobody right rated right let's just be honest and then martin who never even beat a top 10 fighter at lightweight this is not me hating this is a fact petraza was the best win on his resume undefeated world champion liam walsh was undefeated domestic UK fighter. Francisco Fraseca was a domestic Mexican fighter who fucking Ryan Garcia knocked out in two rounds. Jesus Cuellar was coming off of a fucking loss to Leo Santa Cruz and moved up in weight to get fucking knocked out by Tank Davis. Hugo Riez was a 122 pound champion who jumped up two weight divisions to get knocked out by fucking Tank Davis. Ricardo Nunez, who? Gamboa hadn't been relevant for fucking five to seven years when he fought Bud Crawford for a world title. That's how in irrelevant he was when Tank Davis chose to fight him for a fucking vacant WBA regular title, as opposed to challenging one of the champions in the division. And then, of course, Leo Santa Cruz, who'd come up to his fourth weight division, didn't prove anything at 130, but was used because of his Mexican heritage to try to sell Tank Davis's first pay-per-view. First pay-per-view, 2020. Mario Barrow, she moved up to 140. He didn't choose to fight one of the best fighters at 140. He chose to fight a regular champion in Mario Barrow, who was part of the PBC. That's the thing you can look at all these guys. Petraza, Walsh, Roseco, Cuellar, Ru Ruiz, Nunez, Gamboa, Cruz, Barrios, Cruz, Romero, Garcia, uh, Garcia, not Garcia, Martin. Only Garcia and maybe, maybe, maybe Liam Walsh. So out of all those fighters, maybe two of those fighters weren't in-house PBC opponents. Everyone else was an in-house PBC opponent, right? Isaac Cruz, who was a replacement opponent, already had a loss, already had a fucking draw, was only put into place because they needed somebody who was an in-house fight because Rolly Romero was on SA charges. Rolly Romero came back from SA charges. The only reason anyone wanted to watch him fight because they wanted to see him get knocked the fuck out. Hector Luis Garcia was a champion. At 130, they brought him up in weight. Ryan Garcia, they brought him down in weight. And Frank Martin literally looks like he's a really good fighter. I can't hate on him, but he'd never beaten a top 10 lightweight. So how much credit can we give Tank Davis for fighting a guy who's never beaten a top 10 lightweight? How good are you when you even you haven't even faced top 10 competition, right? That ain't ringing fucking any Hall of Fame bells when that's what you've done in your career. Lomachenko... This is his whole career. Fought a guy that was 25 and three in his first professional fight. Beat him. Fought Salido, a world champion. A guy who really is a three-weight world champion. Three-weight world champion. People say he's a taxi driver. This is a guy who beat a fucking pound-for-pound -pound quality fighter uh, twice in his career. As well as Robert Guerrero, right? Who was one of Floyd Mayweather's great opponents. Orlando Salido beat that guy, right? When Lomachenko fought him, it was his second professional fight. Orlando Salido had over 60 fights at that point, or not quite 60, but obviously tons of experience. Came in, overweight, wasn't eligible for the title, fouled like crazy, and the Texas judge or ref decided to not take any points away, and Lomachenko lost a split decision 
in a fight where everybody feels he won. Bounce back and fight undefeated, undefeated Gary Antoine or Gary uh, Russell, right? In a great fight. Russell was very competitive. Russell went on to fucking be the WBC champion at 130, 26 pounds for like six or seven years afterwards. Then he faced three good mid-tier opponents and then moved up because nobody at 126 would fight him. And Nicholas Walters had lost his title on the scale, right? And because of that, the unification fight had fallen through. And they offered Rigo a fight at 124 catch weight with a rehydration. He chose to walk away from that. So there's two huge fights within Lomachenko's first six fights of his career. A Nicholas Walters fight, a Rigo fight, where these guys blatantly fucking walked away because of whatever, whatever the situation was. We know Walters, he didn't walk away. The point was he was no longer a champion. So the whole unification fight fell through because of him missing weight. Then he fought Roman Martinez, uh, a guy who beat Salido uh, uh, controversially. That's why I say Salido should be a three-weight world champion. Anyone who's watched the second fight with Salido and, and Roman Martinez uh, felt that Salido was jobbed and should have become a three-weight world champion at that point. But he went out there, made a sensational victory, knocking him out in five rounds with a great two-piece. To become a two-weight world champion. Then faced Nicholas Walters, who was an undefeated guy who people were saying was the fucking monster from 126 to 130. A guy who destroyed Donaire, excuse me, more impressively than Nicholas, than, than Rigo did. But now people say, oh, he was inactive. He could have took the fight five months earlier. He chose to wait it out. Not Loma. And he could have had the fight at 126 for unification. He lost the fight on the scale his belt on the scale because he was too fucking fat. Not Loma's fault, but people, of course, will ignore that. Then he faced Jason Sosa. Jason Sosa was the only fucking guy, a regular WBA champion, that actually stepped up to face Lomachenko. The other three champions, including Tank Davis, blatantly fucking ducked him. So that's why he fought Sosa. He was supposed to fight Salido in a rematch, but then he fucking agreed to the terms, agreed to everything, but then wasn't able to fight on that date. So Mariaga was a replacement opponent. People literally shit on Lomachenko for facing Mariaga, a guy that was 25 and two, had had a great fight, a war with Nicholas Walters, and was a quality fighter, even years afterwards. But that wasn't the fighter he was supposed to fight. The fighter he was supposed to fight was fucking Salido in a rematch to redeem his only career loss. But because of Salido, not being able to fight on the date that was scheduled after agreeing to the contract, Mariaga was a replacement opponent. Just like Isaac Cruz was a replacement opponent for Tank Davis. Then he fought Rigo. People shit on him because Rigo had to jump up in weight classes. Loma wasn't calling out Rigo, just like Errol Spence wasn't calling out Mikey Garcia. He tried to make a fight with Rigo at 126 for a 124 catch weight. Rigo literally dropped the ball. He could have fought him fucking literally in 2014, 2015 at a rehydration clause and a catch weight, which would have benefited him humongously because of that point, they were looking for big name fighters. At this point, they weren't interested in Rigo. They wanted unification fights, but all the champions were ducking them. He couldn't get a unification fight with any of the champions, including Burchell, Tank Davis, and the other guy. Uh, I always forget how to say his name. So what did they do? They fought Rigo. And Lomachenko said, you know, he's too small. It's not a fight I'm chasing, but, you know, everybody else was calling for it. All the channels on YouTube were pushing for it. They all were predicting that Rigo was going to break Lomachenko's jaw. Do you forget? I don't forget. You guys do because you have a selective fucking memory. Then he moved up in weight after that and faced the number one ring magazine champion, Jorge Linares. In his third weight, he didn't jump up and fight a WBA regular champion to get a useless title. Didn't mean anything. He fought the number one fighter in the division. A guy that was recognized by ring magazine as the number one guy. A guy that was making his seventh title defense at lightweight and ended up knocking him out in a competitive fight. Then he faced Petraza. Petraza, who at this point was a two-weight world champion, the only loss on his resume, Tank Davis. Then he fought Anthony Krola, ex-world champion. 
people criticized that, but it was a mandatory, right? Literally a mandatory. And, and this was a guy that was an ex-world champion, uh, you know, who Linares had fought twice in England, right? But people were okay with Linares fighting him to make big money in England, but people were critical of Lomachenko fighting his mandatory. He destroyed him. Great knockout. Then he faced, faced Luke Campbell to get the vacant WBC title that Mikey Garcia dropped to duck Lomachenko uh, to jump up two weight divisions to fight Errol Spence. Wasn't fucking Lomachenko's fault. He didn't want fucking Luke Campbell. He wanted fucking Mikey Garcia for his first pay-per-view. And then, of course, he fought Teofimo Lopez, which was supposed to be for Undisputed, but because of WBC and Suleiman, and them fucking up shit, uh, it ended up becoming this big controversy. Not because of Lomachenko, because in the post-interview, when they gave Lomachenko that bullshit belt, this President Suleiman even told you Lomachenko was the number one fighter in the division and would be, elevi- would be eligible for undisputed if he won. He ended up losing, and then, of course, that just created controversy. Then he bounced back after his second career loss, right? Uh, A loss that happened seven years later when he was dominating at 130 pounds. Literally, he was on top of the world. That's why nobody wanted to fight him, right? No Maschenko making fucking who quit in a row. Nicholas Walters, Sosa, Mariaga, and Rigo. Four fighters in a row he made quit on the stool. No Mas, no Mas, right? And obviously Roman Martinez, who he knocked the fuck out, right? That's what he did in that division. That's what he did in a short period of time at that weight class. Stop Martinez, stop Walter, stop Sosa, stop Mariaga, stop Rigo. Five fights of that weight class, and he fucking was dominating and destroying everyone. Nobody wanted to get in the ring with him. But now, of course, selective memory ignores that, which forced him to go to 135 and fight much bigger fighters lost to Lopez, and then fought the guy Lopez struggled with. And Lopez literally said he's not going to fight any tall fighters after he struggled with Nakatani. Lomachenko went in there and knocked Nakatani out, dominated and destroyed Kome, should have knocked him out, but just felt bad and guilty for Kome because he's friends with him. And he should have really fought Kome back uh, around 2020, right? Should have fought him 2019, 2020, and became undisputed fighting Kome instead of allowing Lopez to face Kome to win a title so they could try to do their first big pay per view fight. But then, of course, COVID kicked in, so they ended up doing Lopez and Lomachenko for free. Then he faced Jermaine Ortiz after more than a year out of the ring because of the Russian Ukrainian war. Bounced back after that, faced Devin Haney, blatantly got fucking robbed on the scorecards and then contemplated retirement in 2023. Only came back to fight George Cambosis because his father uh, pestered him so much and he felt that he owed his father that, came back to win a world title once again. We look at all the champions on his career he faced. Hasn't had that many fights, less than 20, but Salido Russell, Roman Martinez, Nicholas Walters, uh, Rigo, Linares, Petraza, Krola, Lopez, uh, Kome, Haney, Cambosis. 12 world champions he's faced in his career. 12. And how many not? One, two, three, four. Sosa was a regular champion, so I didn't count him. It could be 13 if you count him. But okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So 12 champions, has he fought that much? Okay, he just fought 21 fights, yeah. So there you go. Currently 18 and three, never was dominated, never fucking destroyed, never crushed in any fights, right? The haters, they were hoping Tank Davis would fight him because he's old and they were hoping that Tank Davis would knock him out so they could use that stoppage to ridicule and criticize Lomachenko some more because that's really their motivation. It's not that they want a good fight. It's that they hope to belittle and diminish Lomachenko's legacy by getting him knocked out. Yet we've had tons of great fighters who got knocked out late in their career. Should we say Roy Jones as an example? Roy Jones, who I fucking think is a better fighter than Floyd Mayweather historically during his reign. But with all those losses that he ended his career with, it's hard to kind of put him in that conversation now, unfortunately. 
And then people want to talk about Canelo Alvarez. I don't even need to look at much Canelo Alvarez, just from 2016 to fucking now. World champions, Smith, Chavez, Golovkin, Jacobs, Kovalev, Smith, Saunders, Plant, Bivol, Charlo, Manguia. 11 world champions he faced. Only Rocky Fielding was a regular champion. Yidrim was never a champion. Ryder was never a champion. And Berlanga was never a champion. So he had one regular champion and three guys he fought that weren't champions. Three. Only three dudes that weren't champions that fucking Canelo Alvarez has fought in his career. But let's go back one time and, and quickly look at Tank Davis' career. So Petraza, Cuellar, Ruiz was a regular champion. Gamboa, Cruz, Mario Barros was a regular champion. I guess now we got to list him as a champion because he got elevated by fucking the WBC. I don't know if it's official yet, so I'll wait off. So that's four. Roy Romero became a champion in a controversial fight, which was ridiculous. Uh, fucking Isaac Cruz is now champion. Garcia, and that's it. Seven. Seven world champions. If you want to say Barrios, that's eight. Even though fucking Barrios won a regular title. Fucking R Romero was gifted a title. A and uh, yeah. But who did he beat that were champions? Champions when he beat them? Batraza, Santa Cruz. Two. Two. He beat two fighters for world titles, Batraza and Santa Cruz. That's all. Literally, that's how many champions he beat for titles. Two. Lomachenko, how many champions did he beat for titles? Uh, not Salido, not Russell. Roman Martinez. Linares, Batraza. Uh, and Cambosis, no. He was obviously, uh, that was a vacant title. So beat three. Three. And Canelo, how many fighters did he beat? They were champions when he beat them. Smith, Golovkin, Danny Jacobs, I can't remember if he was or not, so I just won't count him. Kovalev, Smith, Saunders, Plant. He lost to Bivol. So there you go, six. He beat six fighters, four world titles. And I'm not saying his whole career, because there's more, but maybe more. But, but that we listed there. Oh, of course there was, because there was also, uh, what's his face, at 154, who we unified with. So. so here you go. So what's the difference between these fighters? A Frank Martin, who people glorified mm -hmm. Tank Davis for fighting. A George Cambosis, who Lomachenko just fought to, to win a world title. And, and Berlanga and Jaime Manguia, who Canelo was fighting in his most recent fights, right? Frank Martin, has he ever been a champion? No. He hasn't. Uh, George uh, Cambosis, has he been a champion? Yes. He was a unified champion, three belt champion. Jaime Manguia, was he a champion? Yes, he was a champion. Berlanga, no. Berlanga is closer to Frank Martin, both never champions. Um, does Frank Martin have a really stellar resume? No. George Cambosis, yeah. His best win against fucking Teofimo Lopez, who people had on the pound for pound list, is the most significant victory out of anybody on this fucking list. Easily. Manguilla, um, his resume is better than Martin and Berlanga, but he's been around longer, so he, he's been chopping away a little longer than they have. Berlanga, not bad. You would say at this point it's similar to Martin, maybe a little better. But Martin's performances against the level of opponents maybe were better, more significant up until his fight before he fought Tank Davis. So it just shows you Tank Davis gets a pass, gets praised for facing this fighter, right? Who's never fought a top 10 opponent. Lomachenko is criticized and ridiculed for fighting Cambosis, a unified champion who had a pound for pound fighter on his resume with a victory and a pound for pound fighter with two losses. So he fought like two pound for pound quality fighters and was one for three, right? But 
look at the level of opponent he's facing. Now I throw Lomachenko in there, he's one for four. But literally, that's three pound for pound quality fighters. Frank Martin fought one pound for pound quality fighter, got knocked the fuck out. Jaime Munguia fought one pound for pound fighter, went the distance, lost the decision. Berlanga is now going to get an opportunity to face a pound for pound fighter. So again, no different than Martin or Munguia. Obviously, Cambosis has had more opportunities than them, but that's because Cambosis did more. And because of that, he was in a position to fucking get more. And that's exactly what he did, right? But trying to fanboy one fighter for this kind of quality of opposition, but then diminish and discredit others. I mean, people talk about how dudes are ducking young, hungry lions, right? But yet, that's exactly what Canelo Alvarez is doing, right? People talk about him facing easy cherry pick opponents. Yet he faced an undefeated light heavyweight in his fourth weight division, kind of like what Leo Santa Cruz did when he faced Tank Davis. The difference is he lost to Bibble, but he didn't get knocked the fuck out like Leo Santa Cruz did. And previously, he fought a, a guy in the fourth division and beat him. So at light heavyweight against world champions, Canelo Alvarez is one for one right? One for one. One and one, one KO. Tank Davis has never fought a pound for pound quality fighter. He's never fought the best fighter in a weight division. He never fought the best fighter at 130 pounds because he never fought Lomachenko. He didn't even fight the second, third, fourth, or fifth best fighter in that division. Go look at his resume. He didn't even fight fucking Tevin Farmer for unification. And then he moved to 140. He didn't fight the best fighter in that division. He faced Berrios, who maybe was five, six, or seven. Maybe. Maybe lower, right? He didn't fight Pro Grace, Ramirez, fucking Josh Taylor. Uh, and obviously there was other fighters as well. And, and he didn't fight any of them. And then at 135, he hasn't faced any of the best fighters there. He didn't face Devin Haney when he was a champion, undisputed champion. He could have forced the WBA to mandate him as Devin Haney's mandatory. He didn't. He could fight Shakur. He hasn't. He could have fought Lomachenko earlier when he first came up in weight class and Lomachenko had titles. He didn't. Right? He could have tried to fucking get a Cambosis fight, paying Cambosis more money than he could have made to fight anyone. Cambosis would have jumped at it because he was all motivated by money. He didn't. So once again, Tank Davis never fought any of the best fighters at any of the four, three weight divisions he's fought at. None. Munguia did, Canelo. Berlanga did, Canelo. Cambosis did, Haney, Lomachenko, and Tierfamo Lopez. But fans are going to be so irrational and push so much hate towards certain fighters. You know, I just wanted to compare Floyd Mayweather, who gets all this praise, uh, right? Yet, look at these guys he faced to end his career, right? And, and I just saw John Boxing and Dante praising Floyd again in videos, even though Floyd's been retired for a million fucking years. I actually saw people criticizing Pacquiao because he struggled against a kickboxer recently. Yet, they failed to talk about how when Manny Pacquiao was fighting world champions like Keith Thurman, and Yugis for world titles. Floyd Mayweather was fighting fucking 118-pound Japanese kickboxers. <laughs> and now he's fighting fucking Gotti's son, as if that's significant. <laughs> okay. People are delusional, man. But this is who he fought. Robert Guerrero, a guy that had lost to Salido. Virgil Ortiz, a guy that fucking was in my Dana fight and, and threatened to retire, right? a guy who had multiple losses and was already known to be a mental case. And he showed again in the Floyd Mayweather fight, mentally he was fucking broken. He literally broke in that fight, like fucking kissing Floyd's hands. And it was pathetic. It was fucking sickening to watch, but it just shows you mentally where he was. He was fucked and he was happy to get a payday. And Berto, Berto had already been exposed. He was a shell of himself, right? But because that's the fight Al Heyman wanted Floyd to have years earlier. He figured that should be the fight that he had to end his career, right? A guy who was literally three and three in his last six fights. Three wins, three losses in his last six fights. 
And that's the way Floyd wanted to go out. But we're going to criticize Canelo for fighting Mangui and Berlanga. Two guys that were undefeated when they chose to fight Canelo Alvarez. But you're going to fucking be okay with Floyd fighting a guy who literally was three and three in his last six fucking professional fights. And Maidana, the best out of the three, this is a guy who had already lost to Amir Khan, a guy Floyd ducked. When fucking people voted on who they wanted Floyd to fight next, everyone said Amir Khan because stylistically he was going to be different. He chose to fight the flat-footed Latino fighter in Maidana, a guy that Khan had already beaten. And Devin Alexander, another guy that people actually had discussed as a possible opponent for Floyd Mayweather because of his different style of boxing, right? A boxer mover, a guy that fought behind a jab and would have forced Floyd Mayweather to not fight in his conventional manner. Uh, had already beaten Maidana as well at 147. And Maidana was cherry picked for Adrian Broner, but Adrian Broner was so fucking mentally checked out at that point that he ended up losing. So then Floyd felt that he needed to take on that opponent as opposed to having Adrian Broner potentially rematch Maidana, which would have made more sense and would have helped elevate Adrian Broner's career and potentially put him back where he'd fallen off of. But people are okay with what Floyd did, right? With this quality of opposition. You think there's a Jaime Manguia here? Maybe a Berlanga, but, but these guys all had losses in their resume. All four of them had losses before they fought Floyd, right? Where's the young hungry lion out of this fucking crew? There is none. So it's clear to see that boxing fans are hypocrites who move the goalposts based on who they support. We see this shit all the time. Yeah, I'm a fan for fighters, but I'm not radical. If you ever watch my lives, when I watch my favorite fighters fight, I often make predictions where I'm picking against my favorite fighter to lose, right? Example, Thurman versus Pacquiao. I predicted Thurman would outbox and beat Pacquiao. I also predicted Ugas would beat him. I predicted that Devin Haney uh, initially would beat Lomachenko. And then after more study and research, I predicted that Lomachenko would win, right? because I, I just found that Lomachenko would take away his jab. And, and then, of course, Devin Haney wouldn't be nearly as effective as he was against other fighters. And that's what happened. He wasn't nearly as effective uh, with Lomachenko as he had been with other fighters. Example, Regis Progress. I often pick against my favorite fighters. I'm one of the few people on YouTube that said that Bibble was going to beat fucking Canelo Alvarez. Because based on the way Kovalev boxed and was winning rounds and I thought was winning the fight before he got knocked out by Canelo, I felt that Bivol would be able to do the same thing, but far more effectively, which he did. Right? I'm such a Lomachenko fan, but yet in the Lopez fight, I didn't make excuses. I said that I felt Lomachenko could get a draw if he won the 12th round. He lost the 12th and I said, yeah, I think Lopez won the fight. He did right? Is this a radical fan? Of course it's not. Me being a fan of somebody is just me being a fan. But we see the difference between being a fan and being radical. You don't see me making video after video after video after video day in and day out trying to push narratives of fighters that I like. You would have to go watch channels like Fan and Knockout Boxing, the LDBC, Ego, and channels like that, that even fanboy channels they don't like right? Like Ryan Garcia. None of them support him, but because they know he sells and they will get money from YouTube by talking about him on videos, they made a fucking million and one videos about him. See, this is the difference between being a radical fan and being a boxing fan. I don't need to be radical because I'm not going to cry when fighters I like lose. When fighters I like lose, they lose. Now what I hope they do is redeem themselves, bounce back, because bouncing back from a loss it is almost better than never fucking having a loss. I know people that fanboy for Floyd Mayweather don't understand that because the only thing they use to try to put Floyd Mayweather above other legacy fighters in boxing history is the fact that he was undefeated. 
yet other fighters that were undefeated, they don't give those guys nearly as much credit, ironically enough, right? You never heard any of these people praising Marciano as the best heavyweight in boxing history because he retired at 48 and 0. No, never. Because it had nothing to do with being undefeated. In Floyd's situation, it had to do with him being a black American, right? And the people, of course, that would never put Marciano in the position as the best heavyweight of all time are probably the same people that would put Floyd Mayweather as the ATG, even though real boxing historians don't. But everyone has an opinion. The point is some people's opinions are biased and radical and they can't support it. They can't use facts to back it up. They can't support anything they say. So they just say radical shit. They just talk out their ass and they know that nobody's going to hold them accountable for it. So, you know, they do it. They literally lie blatantly in videos consistently. Right. They go out and they shit on one fighter who's literally done heaps more, but then go out and defend a fighter who's done way less. And don't see the hypocrisy in what they're doing because they don't care. And the people that watch their channels or support them, they don't care either. Because with these guys, it's not about boxing. It's never been about boxing. A lot of the big channels is all about AdSense and fucking money. They'll say whatever it takes to make money. Right, Showbiz the Adult. Literally, that guy had a video taken down from a newer channel on YouTube. Right? Because the guy made a video criticizing Showbiz for stealing his uh, idea, his concept. Uh, and I don't know if he did or he didn't. But that's the video the guy made. He felt like Showbiz copped uh, a, a idea that he was consistently doing on his channel and, and was one of the things that was getting his channel a lot of views and showbiz literally fucking got that video taken down because that's how petty a lot of these fucking youtubers are a petty motherfucker got my channel closed meanwhile i didn't do anything different than he did he did the same thing to my videos that i did to his videos literally he was putting out a video again and again and again and again trying to expose me as not a bud crawford fan but as a crawford hater because i said prior to bud crawford fighting in dongu that bud crawford beating in dongu did not make him pound for pound number one and he tried to use that video that clip to try to say that i hate bud crawford and i don't give him credit but yet he fought in dongu when at 140 pounds he, he was just in line to fight Errol Spence at 147. A lot of things have happened between this period of time, right? But that's how radical certain people are. They think using a quote out of context from six, seven years earlier somehow exposes you. Meanwhile, what I did is I used a quote from him a month or two earlier when he was trying to praise Stephen Fulton to be the man that was easily going to expose and beat Anui. And that if Inui actually did beat him, he would put him pound for pound number one on his on his pound for pound list. So I used that clip to expose him because we saw what happened after Inui beat Stephen Fulton. This guy put him number eight or number nine in his pound for pound list and literally put Devin Haney at number two for beating George Cambosis. The same George Cambosis that he gave Lomachenko zero credit for beating to become a world champion recently, right? Once again, exposing blatant hypocrisy, but yet you report my channel for doing the exact same thing I did, right? This is the problem with these, these fanboy channels on YouTube. They're emotional, they're radical, they're sensitive, super sensitive. Like nobody can say that I'm sensitive because the things I've had to deal with for as long as I've been on YouTube, including my channel getting closed down by a fucking retard. <laughs> right? You know, obviously sensitivity is not my my uh, my issue. But we see these other channels, showbiz, sensitive. If you have a comment that uh, goes against the narrative he's pushing on his channel, he gets very sensitive. Right? Champ side, same. All the LDBC. Right? Dante, block you. Ego, block you. Right? They don't want dissenting fucking opinions on their channel. So they block everybody that has a different opinion than them. 
and keeps only fucking yes men on their channels. The only people you'll find on their channels are yes men. People that are there yet just to kiss their fucking ass and agree with everything they say, whether they're just fucking sheep who follow the leader or they're just ignorant and stupid and they fucking can't do research on their own. But this is the YouTube that we love and, you know, participate on. But leave your comments below. Let me know what you think. Uh, have any other examples? Please feel free to uh, leave them in the comment section below. Uh, we love a crowd that participates. Just, uh, of course, be respectful. That's all. That's all. That's all we ever say. I I'm not blocking channels or blocking people. Hawker Mustang, my, my bad. I still don't know how to fucking unblock you because people literally were cloning people's channels coming on my channel and, and just doing that kind of shit. That shit, like, is what people used to do. Now some people are still doing that, cloning people's names and, and coming on channels pretending to be them. Uh, you know, so it's my bad. I, I tried to unblock him. And of course I, I want to unblock him because a uh, Hawker Mustang is a important part to YTBC, you know, YouTube boxing. He's been around for a long time. So that was not my intent. So I do apologize. Uh, you know, unfortunately shit happens and uh anybody that knows how i can unblock him feel free to leave that in the comment section as uh, below as well but uh thanks for watching everyone remember to like subscribe and share and i'll see you next time and remember right now olympic sports is on i know a lot of people are emotional because of the fucking opening ceremony who gives a fuck we don't watch fucking olympics because of opening ceremonies and the politics of fucking the olympics we watch to fucking see the athletes fucking perform I don't give a fuck about the opening ceremony. I didn't even watch that shit. Who cares? And they offended some Christians who are in their feelings. Fuck off, Christians. You offended the whole fucking world for hundreds of fucking years. And now you're fucking crying about being offended? Give me a fucking break. <laughs> you didn't have problems coming to fucking Aboriginal countries, fucking calling them heathens, not giving their fucking culture and their fucking traditional uh, beliefs any respect at all, throwing their kids in fucking... Uh, schools fucking molesting them and raping them and ruining the family and, and causing chaos and fucking shit wherever you went even in first world normal countries but now you feel offended because they had a bunch of trannies uh pretend to do the last supper who gives a fuck i think i've seen pictures of dogs in, in doing the last supper were you offended by that too people are mental like this is punch drunk a dude that fucking you know he was in the joint and fucking doing drugs and all kinds of shit before he found religion dude's got tattoos all over his face and neck and now he is upset and agreeing with ryan fucking garcia and the shit that he says anyone that agrees with ryan garcia give me a fucking break that just tells you everything you need to know you agree with ryan garcia you're obviously fucking touched but let me know what you think leave it in the comment section below stay tuned this week i'm going to be going live for bud crawford's big fight card this weekend best fight card in 30 years